This one uh, in the lead up to this was was insanely popular. I think we had when we when we published the topic we're going to talk about and people register their interest. This is episode yeah. 14, 15. Easily the most people register their interest for this than any other topic so far, which is I think I think kind of kind of kind of interesting, um, and perhaps not not too surprising. It's a great topic, but um, yeah, <laughs> good crowd for this one. Emma said hello. Great. So um, um, shall I let um, Peter and Martin sort of introduce themselves? Start, Craig? Yeah, start the introductions. I'm still still sorting things here on the scene, but yeah, go ahead. Great. What just? So just while people join, as, as Craig's just posted, we're talking about sort of vascular assessment and all things vascular uh, this, this week. Uh, really, uh, like I say, it's superbly popular so far, um, and as it should be, you know, it's the, uh, pretty important to us. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves, because my introduction won't do either of them justice. Um, I think it would be great to, to get a bit of an idea also of how you guys both ended up where you ended up, how you sort of, you know, the journey you took to, to the specialism you're now in. So, I mean, maybe Martin, you want to go first and then hand on to, to Peter when you're done, if that's okay. Uh, could I ask Peter to go first on that one? Because she's, <laughs> she's got a great story of how she got into it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Mark. yeah, of course. Okay. Um, well, I guess I got into vascular research and vascular podiatry because I was born out of pure frustration, I suppose. I was working up at the high-risk foot clinic, seeing lots of patients who were in desperate need of vascular assessment so we could determine where they needed to be going and onward referral and management of their wounds. Um, and I just found that the vascular assessment that we were doing wasn't, wasn't really giving me the answers that I required. So Dopplers were difficult to do. Um, we were lucky if we found a monophasic pulse in a lot of them. Um, we had this automated machine that was hard to use. Um, you had to do the tests in a specific order. Um, I hated it. <laughs> and um, But everyone was like, it's automatic, it's better. I was like, oh, I just hated it. And um, and then um, the ankle brachial ind indexes were always above 1.4. Some of them were up to two because they were so calcified. So at the end, all I had was, well, they're calcified and they probably have disease, but I don't really know. Um, so I was talking to, I started doing a bit of supervision at the university and I was talking to Viv Tudor about it. And she just said to me, well, there's only one way to find out and to get your answer. And uh, she said, it'll be easy. Go on, you can do it. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. Um, so I enrolled in a research high degree and away I went. And uh, easy is certainly not the word that I would use to describe my experience, but um, it's been very enjoyable. So um, mm -hmm. I've continued on in the vascular field and I've created a little network here and I work closely with surgeons and sonographers um, and that's just been quite amazing because I get a whole different perspective on um, vascular management, which is what I was previously missing. I was really focusing on um, the assessment and how to get the assessment right and then kind of going, oh, well, got my answer. And then I'd be like, oh, what do I do? Oh, I guess I should just refer them on. <laughs> um, but um, now I've got a much more of an um, in-depth perspective on the vascular management of the patient as well. Um, but Martin, if you want to share your story, I'm keen to... Actually, before, before, yeah, you, do, before you do, Martin, hey, Peter, just <clears throat> yeah. let me know you're doing this. Viv, no. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, just, I was hoping she might be watching. I'd sort of, yeah. Oh, she to, doesn't have Facebook, yeah. She doesn't. Oh, that might explain it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> I'll tell no, it's, it's good. It's good. I mean, hearing Peter's story, it's mine's similar in a way in that I went, I came, I came into high risk foot management early in my career, got very interested in complex wound care. I'd sort of um, tiddled around with MSK, nail surgery, um, dermatology a little bit, um, and eventually found my niche in wound care, I think, and then complex wound care, working um, for a while, uh, mainly in the community, but w plugging into hospital based early MD teams. Um, and working very close with a, an inspiring leg ulcer nurse specialist called Irene Yates, who taught me really how to value the uh, lower limb vascular assessment and to use that to help make clinical decisions. Mm. I think I'd historically been taught um, at the uh, podiatry college um, that uh, vascular disease was a problem. And it was almost like a negative paradigm in podiatry that you did it, you, you, you got the assessment result and then you referred people on and that was it. 
and certainly when I started to work more in complex wound care and with uh, diabetes and PVD and rheumatology patients, realizing that the assessment and the diagnosis was only the start of the journey for the patient, and often those journeys were really poor, um, I started to realize that maybe podiatry could play a much bigger role in, in the management, but we had to probably get a bit more skilled up, a bit more confident. Um, and so I took myself down that journey gradually and I came away from wound care because wound care is pretty flooded in the UK with uh, lots of practitioners who want to get involved, but nobody's doing vascular podiatry yet, um, apart from a few colleagues um, around the country who've, who've probably had similar journeys and realized that the, that the whole area of lower limb vascular disease is an open book for better diagnosis and management. And so I worked with vascular nurse specialists and vascular surgeons that were friendly to us um, 10, 15 years ago. We had that situation where we had a bit of an antagonistic relationship with vascular surgeons, I think 20 years ago. We got one lecture in the university, and then we were sort of blamed for the, the problem patients sometimes. And um, working more closely with our local vascular surgeon, um, in, in uh, Thameside in East Manchester, he and, and the, vas and the uh, vascular nurse specialist and the, and the tissue viability nurse, the leg ulcer nurses, they really opened me up to that MD team working within a vascular umbrella rather than just, for example, a diabetes umbrella. And here I am today, a few years on, um, sort of championing community-led lower limb peripheral arterial disease um, clinical assessment, diagnostic and treatment services, very much in partnership with the vascular teams. Yeah. Actually, Martin, just on that historic antagonistic relationship you mentioned, I have on one occasion seen this, and I've heard this story from others, that uh, uh, lectures by vascular surgeons, they list the causes of amputation, and podiatry is on the list. Yes, um, still I haven't heard that recently. <laughs> oh, my but, God. <laughs> but I, I, I've, yeah, I, I've, I've seen that, and, and, and I think the point you made, it's, it's often the last clinician they saw is the one that gets blamed. And, um, yes. but having said that, I haven't seen or heard that recently, but that historical antagonistic relationship you commented on that uh, might yeah. have something to do with it. I think that was uh, 20 years ago. That was pretty much the norm because we had no history with our vascular teams. I think now, particularly with the advent of MD team uh, working with diabetes, we've, we've created a lot of good relationships and, and there's a new generation of vascular surgeons coming through with no prior conception. And I find them really good to work with. We've got some brilliant surgeons yeah, in, no, in the UK now that are working with us very constructively on, on high risk lower limb, everything to do with high risk lower limb. And mm. so it's taking it away from one disease, but it's that sort of, that sort of tr attempt to salvage the limb, save the limb, and also now save the life of the patients that we're working with. Yeah. Okay, Ian, what are the questions? Awesome. Yeah, so we've had we've had quite a few questions come in, which we'll we'll rattle through, and then we'll we'll come to the the Facebook Live questions uh, as they as they come in uh, thereafter. Um, one of them at the top of the list, which sort of touches on on something you just said, Martin, is about is about what a vascular assessment consists of. So, I mean, I guess two parts to this question potentially. The first is obviously in the high risk setting, which I know you both probably are, are mostly within. What would a what would one of your vascular assessments look like? But then the second part being for a lot of our listeners who may not be in high risk or MDT, they might be private practitioners. What should a, a vascular assessment look like at that level as well? Um, and, and your thoughts yeah. on that? Uh, do you want me to go first on that, Peter? Or? Yep, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I think it's really about constructing it from the ground up. So that the basic idea of taking a good history from patients is universal to all clinicians. In the lower limb, it's sort of taking that history in the context often of lower limb symptoms or signs of disease, such as um, um, non-palpable pulses to go right back to basics. And then that sort of prior history of things like uh, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, maybe um, hyperlipidemia, being aware of that in, in everybody over the age of around 40, that it could be uh, leading to um, some sort of vascular problem. And then when you start to get the symptoms coming in, you'd be taking that, um, uh, going through that assessment using a structured questionnaire, such as the uh, Edinburgh Claudication Questionnaire, which is a really useful tool for trying to tease out whether a a lower limb pain that comes on during activity is ischemic related or is it MSK related, for example, or nerve related. 
Um, and um, I think starting with those things, so history, pulses and symptom um, package can be done by all podiatrists and should be done by all podiatrists um, in a sort of fairly structured way. And then you're moving on to the tools a little bit where if you've got a Doppler, um, you'll get it out, you'll turn it on, you'll put the battery in, hopefully scrabble around and find some gel and then have a listen to those um, non-palpable pulses um, and maybe the palpable ones as well and find that there's a signal there that you either think may be abnormal or may be normal and then from that you may go on to um, do an ABPI, an ankle brachial pressure index um, um, and, and think about whether that result might be normal and then maybe a toe pressure but I think for most general podiatrists in the UK they tend to stop at the Doppler you know so they, they, they'll work up to Doppler but there might be a whole mishmash of, of how they assess in a structured way before then and we're trying to move them towards a bit more structured thinking in vascular that, you know, take this cardiovascular related history, feel the pulses, have a look at the foot, get your Doppler out and have a listen to the main pulses from foot to popliteal, for example, um, in a couple of minutes, um, and then make a reasonable decision about whether you've got suspected um, arterial disease, for example, um, and whether that person will require further um simple non-invasive diagnostic testing to confirm or exclude disease and if they do require that whether you can facilitate it in your practice or whether you need to refer them on to somebody else who can do it mm -hmm. i think that would be the basis of for me of, of what we'd like to see podiatry moving towards thanks martin and i'll just add so i think Certainly in Australia, in private practice, it's very similar. So um, podiatrists will use their Doppler after taking a history and often stop there. There is a move towards um, pressure measurement, thankfully. But um, I was talking to Martin about this yesterday, and I think we need to shift the way that we think about vascular assessment in clinical practice, particularly in private practice, you often have clinicians who will charge extra or have a separate appointment, a longer appointment for a biomechanical assessment, but we don't hold the same value for a vascular assessment. And I'll often have clinicians say to me, Peter, just tell me the one test I need to do. I just want to do one test that will tell me everything I need to know. And um, I understand that because I've worked in private practice and I know time is limited. You're trying to do a general treatment, plus you've got, oh, it's the annual diabetes assessment. Okay, I'll whip out my Doppler and just quickly check that that's okay in my monofilament. Um, but we don't think of a biomechanical assessment that way. And Craig, I don't think you'd ever have someone say to you, just tell me the one test I need to do. Um, so all of all I have, of, I have actually. <laughs> <laughs> so all of the parts of our vascular assessment tell us something different, and all of them have their pitfalls, um, and we all need to be aware of those. But um, we need to start thinking of it differently and seeing the value in performing a vascular assessment because like Martin was alluding to, not only are we detecting disease in their limb, but when they have that disease, they also very highly likely they have cardiovascular disease and they're at really high risk of having an event, um, so heart attack or stroke. So it's really important that their risk factors are managed appropriately. Um, so it is somewhere, an area of practice that is really important and I think we just need to shift our thinking around the assessment. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about that Martin touched on was claudication um, because I think traditionally we've been told, right, it's a, it's a cramp-like pain and um, it uh, presents with exercise and, uh, and yes, it'll stop when they rest. Um, but claudication often... It, I don't know if you agree, Martin, but I just it presents in such strange ways. People don't tell you that they have a cramp-like pain um, after 100 metres. They'll say funny things like, oh, my legs feel tight or I just have to stop um, or my legs feel tired. It's often, um, it's often not the clinical symptoms we would expect. But the key thing um, to identify as a clinician is that it will go away within 10 minutes of rest. So a musculoskeletal pain will hang, so arthritic pain, which is what we'd most commonly see in that population, generally speaking, 
it will hang around for more than 10 minutes. So that's a really key thing um, to take away. And I've just started using the Edinburgh um, claudication questionnaire and I find it really good. And if you're unsure about um, how to ask about claudication, it's a really good tool because it just guides you through and helps you start seeing, oh, okay, yes, that's, that's not claudication. Um, yeah. So if you're unsure so you're, about how to ask about it, that's a really good place to start. There's one key question there that we find a lot of our podiatrists refer to us, and it's the question, does the pain ever begin when you're standing or sitting? Mm. And we'll often tease that question out a bit with our patients where we think it isn't vascular related and find that they do get the calf pain and it does come on with prolonged standing, such as at the um, ironing board, at the bus stop, in the kitchen sink. And that immediately tells me that it's pro that, that particular pain probably isn't uh, ischemic related. So mm. we're moving away from the diagnosis, whereas if they never get it standing um, or sitting, and it only ever comes on during walking and, and forces them to stop and then eases off, yeah, it's likely to be claudication. Like Peter says, it's it's often not described as cramp. If you offer the word cramp, they'll say no. Mm. Um, and they'll, they'll call it a tightness or a vice-like feeling in, in, in the leg. And so I tend not to lead with the word cramp now and just ask about, do you get any discomfort or um, pain in the leg? Um, and sometimes I might try words secondary to that, such as uh, what does it feel like? Is it, is, it, is it throbbing, burning, aching, tight or cramp-like? And the patient will then pick and... We, we get so many comorbidities that are linked together now. So the claudicant, the, the, the male claudicant with a single claudication, slim age 65 smoker, we rarely get many more. They're all um, people with other problems like arthritis, COPD, diabetes, um, and you know, you're, you're teasing out the arterial disease from amongst that mixed baggage of other symptoms these days. Sure. Mm. Can, can, yeah, can, I can I just ask, that claudication questionnaire, which I just Googled as we were speaking, is that any much use for clinical practice? Um, it's used by many clinicians, but not all. I mean, it's, okay. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a simple tool because it's, it's only five or six questions. And it, in a structured way, when it's used, it's reasonably validated um, mm. to be likely to be uh, pointing towards arterial disease. So it is used in clinical practice rather than just as a research tool. Mm. I find that quite common in the UK. And it's quite quick to administer so it would literally take a minute um so there's five questions and it's very straightforward so even when you, you allow time for the patient to go uh yeah i guess um you'd still it'd be able to administer it very quickly yeah mm -hmm. i have to, i have to admit i haven't actually heard of it but it sounds as though it might be useful um to teach people or clinicians more about those claudication symptoms we, given the problem yeah. we've, um, Peter, we, yeah. we've designed a, a five minute assessment form craig in the uk now because like peter was saying people want to give me the answer on how to do the vascular assessment so we've, we've done a basic um a mini assessment pro forma where you're thinking it might be vascular where you gather the cardiovascular risks you check the pulses and you ask the claudication symptoms and the whole thing takes the busy clinician five minutes at the end of that five minutes, they've got information that will lead them either away from or towards vascular cause. And it can be really helpful in clinical decision-making and appropriate referrals. Yeah. Maybe in the comments, we'll link to that um, when we're finished later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, certainly not the intention to, to take today and, and merge it into an MSK talk, but a couple of questions that came in were MSK sort of themed and, and you kind of touched, uh, uh, Peter, there on, on sort of the biomechanical assessment. Um, the first one I'll pitch out uh, is, um, do you think that within uh, MSK assessments, we, we ignore uh, vascular side of assessment a bit too much? I definitely think I'm guilty of doing this myself. We, we think MSK without even entertaining the idea that something might be vascular. Mm, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I guess it's just being aware of the symptoms and how they present differently. Um, I guess if you're looking at anyone who's older um, and in that risk category, you should always have it in the back of your mind. But, um, yeah, I guess it's like anything. If you don't see it all the time, it can be difficult without doing your performing your testing. Um, I know when I worked um, up in the high-risk foot clinic, you know, Charcot's were so common because we'd see it all the time. But um, 
when I was a new grad in private practice, I remember seeing a shako going, oh, that foot's hot. Not sure what's going on there, um, which is one of the great mistakes <laughs> of my career. Um, but, um, but yes, I guess if, you, if you're not aware of the symptoms, that's when you can use those tools to try and um, determine if something is vascular or not. But in saying that, you know, it's highly unlikely if you get um, a 20-year-old woman presenting with plantar heel pain that, you know, there's a vascular component to that heel pain. But um, if you've got a 65-year-old woman um, with midfoot pain, I mean, uh, people can get claudication pain in their foot. So it's wherever the um, occlusion is, it's distal to that. So it can present in the foot, in the calf, um, or in the thigh or the buttocks, depending on where the occlusion is. So I guess it's just um, being aware of the typical symptoms and um, knowing what assessment to do from then on. Yeah, taking a good history, obviously. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, so we, one of the questions that came in as well was about uh, compartment syndrome. I think it was chronic exertional compartment syndrome. And the way this will often present is people uh, saying something feels tight, it feels like a cramp, it feels like they, they can't continue through it, but it will recede when they stop exercising. And it, it kind of sounds a bit like the way you just described claudication. So, I mean, let's talk a bit about some, I guess, some of the lower limb differentials, uh, you know, the things, the MSK and the, and the, and the sort of uh, vascular things that can, can mask each other. Is compartment syndrome the big one or are there any others that we're not thinking about? Martin, what do you think on that one? Um, I think compartment syndrome is something I don't come across often in a patient that I easily recognize anyway. Um, but it is a possibility and that sort of chronic one you just described, I think in that, in that case, if that got referred to me, I'd be going back to basics, taking that cardiovascular history in the patient. I'd be palpating pulses at the feet and in the popliteal area. Um, and I'd be then listening with the Doppler and, and any sort of in, inclination of, of it being vascular, I'd be wanting to do an ankle or a toe pressure. Um, to sort of establish that but I, I think yeah it, we, we do get a few um, chronic leg pains where we think it isn't vascular but we're not sure what it is and my my general feeling with that still is that I'm not an expert in other areas and I tend to move it on I'll try and gather the best symptom history that I can around the problem um, and a, a reasonable history of the patient sort of onset and the lifestyle things like that and if I think it's more of an MSK problem I'll send it that way we also get chronic venous disease producing a degree of uh, edema in the lower limbs sometimes and discomfort around the edema. Um, and then you've got things like DVT when you get that sort of that sort of classic tight sudden onset swollen leg at any, at any age. Um, and, and, and again, that would present quite differently to claudication, but initially it's a pain in the leg that comes on when you're standing often worse and, and, and walking worse. So I think he's trying to f just sort of think around the box a bit. Is it MSK? Is it venous? Is it arterial? Or is it, is it, is it um, neurogenic? You know, is, is it, a, is it a, 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 sort of a problem coming from the lower spine at all? And, you know, as a podiatrist, you've, you've got a bit of a background in thinking around all these areas, but you might not be that confident to um, diagnose or um, take a best guess sometimes in the other areas. So I, I tend to move things on and in a best guess scenario back to GP with my best guess. Um, or to another colleague if I've got links to MSK or, or to the, um, uh, the, the, for example, the Lego also nurse specialist who will assess a venous problem for me if I think it's primarily venous rather than arterial and then take it from there. And the vascular team, of course, if I'm not sure, if, it's, if it seems vascular but I'm just not sure, lymphedema, arterial, venous, I'll move it on to them and ask for their opinion. I think that's the key thing. If you're not sure it's a significant symptom, don't hold on to it, move it on. <clears throat> Yep, I agree. And um, I think in terms of red flag conditions, Martin touched on that DVT, um, as he said, can occur at any age. So young women can uh, present with a, with a DVT. Um, so that's something that um, probably would present in an MSK clinic and to be aware of that one. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Just glancing down my question list. Let's let's get back onto the, the more vascular stuff. And um, uh, a question about PAD: uh, Should we be screening patients, uh, asymptomatic patients, for peripheral arterial disease as as a sort of baseline standard? And if so, what 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 is feasible in private practice? Um, Peter, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, 
So PAD is mostly asymptomatic. So more than 50% of patients with PAD will have no symptoms at all. So yes, we need to be um, assessing people who are deemed at risk. So people at risk would be people over the age of 50 who are currently smoking, people over the age of 50 with diabetes, or people over the age of 65 with risk factors like hyperlipidemia, cholesterol, um, any kind of vascular history. So yes, absolutely, even if they're not presenting with claudication symptoms, they need to um, be assessed. In terms of what's feasible in private practice, if you can't do it all, because uh, ideally you do everything, um, really trying to get those basics right. So taking a solid history, which you can do while you're doing your general treatment. Um, so instead of chatting about their grandchildren or whatever, um, really try and drill into their vascular history. And then moving on to pulse palpation, that's always where we start, um, and then Doppler examination. Doppler is a really valuable tool. It's one of our most valuable tools, in my opinion. Um, we just need to put the time into it to get it right, uh, because what I find is podiatrists will rush through a Doppler, and again, I totally understand that our time is limited, but it's very easy to make a wonderful Doppler um, triphasic signal appear monophasic with incorrect technique or if you don't put the time into getting right on top of the artery. So um, really spending the time to try and get a good Doppler signal, um, in my opinion, would be um, a really valuable place to start. Um, and then I would, I would then um, base my direction depending on the patient. So I would um, be always including a pressure measurement, but that would depend on the patient's comorbidity. So in someone with diabetes, I would always include a toe pressure and ideally a toe brachial index. Uh, because that tells us about the small vessels which can be affected first and independently of the large vessels, which is what we're screening with our Doppler. Um, so in people with diabetes, that's the way I would go. In smokers and younger people or people without diabetes, I'd tend to go towards an ABI. Um, and I've just lost my train of thought. Martin, did you have something to say on that one? Yeah, no, I think it's a very similar general uh, approach. I think mm -hmm. the issue of screening for PAD, asymptomatic PAD, it's been decided at the national level, uh, in the UK at least, and in America, uh, not to do that, that it's not cost effective or not appropriate to be screening the population, uh, say everybody aged 50 plus in PAD. But the, we do have the um, sort of health checks at the age of 40 in the UK that flag up cardiovascular risks. We have the whole diabetic foot screening program up and running. So everybody in theory with diabetes gets an annual foot check um, during which, of course, um, pulses are palpated. Now, the big question is what happens if those pulses are non-palpable? Um, and then it goes all a bit fudgy. You know, we start to give people risk categories um, for foot ulcer, um, but we don't necessarily instigate structured uh, further assessment um, off the basis of the annual foot screening. So I think we need to be thinking about targeted um, approach to assessing people. Approach, approach, approach to assessing. Um, and, um, and, sorry, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm echoing, I'm a, bit, echoing a bit. Is that some is tacky that, thing? Tacky thing? thing? Yeah, I'm getting the echo. Yeah, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to. <coughs> um, I'll try Ooh. and talk a bit quieter. Yeah, uh, maybe I was shouting too loud. Um, um, but I, I think I think targeting <laughs> people with cardiovascular history and non-palpable pulses for Doppler and ABI as a minimum will be a very good thing. And in the UK, uh, even with diabetes, we tend to have an um, um, an ABPI first approach because of the nice guidance, which is recommended that we go down the line of ABPIs for all with suspected PAD. But like um, Peter's saying, um, toe pressures can be a useful adjunct. And certainly in some of the diabetes patients that I assess, not all of them, but some of them, I am using toe pressures to help me glean more information uh, about disease and severity. Um, and so it's a sort of subgroup of people with diabetes where I suspect calcification that I would target for toe pressures. 
the whole thing being that at the end of the day, the, the actual non-invasive vascular assessment from history taking through claudication pulses and ABI toe pressures, it can be actually done in about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you're chunking that up into planned care, the, the minimum assessment of you know history, pulses, Doppler is a five minute task for a private or NHS or a public health podiatrist. And the ABI toe pressures is actually, when, it, when you get up to speed on it, it's about another 10 minutes to be doing that. So I think we need to think in the health uh, economy about how we build those tests in when it's most appropriate. So not screening everybody with all the tests, but building the layers in as the suspicion for PAD increases. That'd be my thoughts on how we move forward with this within podiatry and generally within PAD planning. Sure. We have actually just had a couple of questions come in related to what you've just been saying, both from Trevor Pryor, who seems to be having a leaking pipe in the cold weather, he says. But the, his first question was to do with the calcification. What do you say to colleagues who state that an ABI is not necessary in patients with diabetes as the results may be false due to a calcification? Uh, can I start with that? Yeah, you go. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that myth has been hanging around for 20 years, so, so, certainly since I was in, in uh, you know, early, early days of my career. And the reality is that everybody I see with diabetes when I do an ABI, the ABI is useful. Um, if the ABI is low, then it's always bad news. It's always a diagnosis of, of PAD usually. Always is, is the wrong word, but nearly always. Um, you, if it's low, you would, you would diagnose PAD in somebody with diabetes. If the ABI is normal, but the results are suspicious, so you might have symptoms or a non-healing wound that would indicate claudication or poor healing, um, and you've got a normal range ABI or an elevated ABI, then of course you'd want to instigate further tests. But for me, the value of the ABI is it, it always gives me some information in diabetes as well as in people without diabetes and also in the renal disease population and the elderly where we have calcification. And if you find calcification in a patient by having an ABI of greater than say 1.3, 1.4, then you've identified a disease process in that person's limb. So you don't, you don't identify um, calcification if you only do toe pressures and this is the problem or only do Doppler. Yeah, so nice. the only way to actually identify calcification uh, that's purely calcification is to get an elevated ABI. So the rationale for not using ABI to me is that utter nonsense. It's an unfortunate hangover from um, a, a sort of group of influential people maybe 20 years ago. And I think in, in the modern complex world of lower limb care in diabetes, we really need to be having a simple but structured approach to this and include toe pressures as part of the assessment. We still don't know what the definitive uh, diagnostic test is for people with diabetes and PAD, but we mm. do know that most of the time, if we use a combination of Doppler, um, ABI and toe pressures, we will find uh, disease and we will identify severity and make reasonable safe clinical decisions my big worry is that the don't do abpi um, message has left a lot of clinicians in a very vulnerable position in that they don't complete a full diagnostic test and mm. then they have problems with wounds that they're treating and briding um, nail surgery for example um, and you know anything that you're doing to intervene in the foot where you haven't identified the uh, the presence or severity of pad is a danger area and we need to think about why we don't do the basic diagnostic testing. Sorry, that's my little rant over. Okay, great. No, <laughs> I, I, that, that's, that's fine. Now, Trevor's second question was, does a biphasic pulse mean there's no PAD? Peter, do you want to come in on my, on my last bit and, and, and add to this one, maybe? Um, mm, that's a really good question. So um, I've done a couple of studies into Doppler and diagnostic accuracy, and I've always defined an abnormal um, abnormal Doppler reading as monophasic. Um, you can talk about the intricacies of Doppler waveforms for hours because um, there's all sorts of little changes to the waveform that indicate certain things. Um, from a biphasic waveform, you're missing the elastic recoil or that last little blip, the last little upstroke at the end. So what you can tell from a biphasic waveform is that the artery is uh, losing some elasticity, um, which isn't necessarily indicative of PAD. 
um, or MAC, or we don't really know, but it's just showing that there's some more stiffness, but there's still adequate, um, adequate blood flow through that vessel that you're on top of. Um, and just further to the calcification um, issue, I recently did a study and uh, we looked at everyone going into a vascular laboratory, so everyone with um, suspected PAD, um, and I pulled out all the diabetes patients and um, from that I looked at how many had visualised MAC, so uh, calcification which was visualised through ultrasonography. And from all of those people with diabetes, 25% um, had calcification. So it's, um, it's only about a quarter that you will see with um, calcification. So I think, um, as Martin was saying previously, people will kind of cling to, oh, the ABI is useless, there's no point. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do any assessment. I'll just do what I want to do. Um, but I guess every single one of our tests, like I said, has its pitfalls and every test that we do is less um, accurate in our people with diabetes, every single one. So TBI, Doppler, all of them, including ABI, are less accurate in people with diabetes and that gives us even more reason um, to do more testing because we need to cover all of our bases and like Martin was saying, um, a low ABI is so definitive. So once you have an ABI that is less than 0.9, there is no doubt that that person has arterial disease. Um, and that's quite clear in all the literature. Um, the specificity of the ABI is very, very high. The only issue is that the sensitivity is quite low. So you might miss people there's a pretty good chance you're going to miss people, particularly if you're relying on that ABI alone. Um, but like I said, if it's low, it's low, there's no doubt. Um, and then again, if it's high, you need to um, treat those people with calcification. They need to have their cardiovascular risk factors managed because when we've got calcification, their risk of cardiovascular event is equally as high as if they've got peripheral arterial disease. There we go. Rant over. <laughs> right. right. Can, I, I, can I pick up Trevor's point there about the question oh, yeah. about biphasic pulses? Yeah. Um, the problem we have in podiatry is that many podiatrists, as well as nurses and doctors, if they're being honest, they're not sure when a pulse is biphasic or not. So they take a best guess. Could I show some waveforms? Is that okay yeah, to try let's, that? Let's, let's, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just bring something up, see if yeah. it works. Perfect. Have you got that? Yep, we've got that. Okay, so if yep. I show you these way, these are real life waveforms from patients that I've seen. And for example, in this first one here, do you see me moving my? Yep, it's working. If I play that one, we have a quick listen. Now we can hear there, I think, that we've got a definite doo 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 doo, so a biphasic signal, but we've also got irregularity which is a secondary issue, but, but, but the biphasic sound is quite clear there. However, we listen to this one. Now, when I ask podiatrists in, in training days what they think about that sound, many of them will say it sounds biphasic. It's a wow, wow, wow. So they will guess at biphasic when we actually know that that signal is a monophasic signal um, and it's indicative of quite early disease usually it's still a fairly vertical spike there on the on the waveform but it's a wow wow and that if we call that a biphasic signal we've missed peripheral mm -hmm. arterial disease in that patient who will undoubtedly um without presence of calcification have a low abpi and certainly if we exercise test them it'll be even lower and if, they, if we do toe pressure tests they'll have a, a low toe pressure or tbi so calling that a biphasic is going to be a problem and we know from experience that many podiatrists are just not confident with identifying these signals at the moment and we need to get better skilled at this and have some sort of validated competency training so we can really get to grips with it and you know this one here this this very sort of obvious to me at least that quiet monophasic, that whoa, whoa, whoa. Now I know that patient's likely to have fairly severe arterial disease, but I've had clinicians say to me, that sounds venous. Now I understand where they're coming from, but that, 
that is not a Venus sound and we need to be able to recognize that. So I think we have to admit, we, it's a wonderful tool, like Peter says, Doppler, but we have to get better at it. At the moment, mm -hmm. we're coasting on thin ice if we rely on one test alone to diagnose or exclude significant disease. So back to Trevor's point, we can't rely on biophysic signal alone, meaning that there's no PAD. Mm -hmm. And it might be interesting, Martin, just to talk through those waveforms. Can you flick back? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know if we've got time for that, but uh, let me, are we okay for, for a minute, yeah, gentlemen? Go, go back, yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> of course. Get the tech working oh, again. Here we go. My little, my little pet love. Um, okay. So you can see, and this is why I think using both our ears and our eyes is useful because it is difficult with your ears sometimes, particularly that one in the middle at the top. Um, mm. If you were just relying on your ears, yeah, I totally understand why you would think that that is two sounds. But if you look at the waveform, and this is a bi-directional Doppler, it doesn't drop below the line. Um, and also you can see the widening in that systolic complex, that first initial, and there's just a lack of that recoil at the end. Um, so if you look at it in more detail, you can see, yes, it's a monophasic pulse. The one on the side is very obvious because it's got the weak squealy lines. So you can see the one on the top left hand corner of your screen. It goes straight up and there's a nice point and it goes straight down. The systolic complex is tight, so that's good. And we've got an, a fairly reasonable dichrotic notch below the, um, below the line. So the bigger that dichrotic notch, the better. Um, sometimes you'll get changes. So when the foot is hyperemic for a reason, so say there's an active infection in the foot and the foot's hyperemic, it will, oh, beautiful. <laughs> We didn't even plan this. Um, it will sit above the line like that. So you'll still have a biphasic waveform, but it's sitting just, above the just line. Just have a quick listen, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's some degree of hyperemia there. But we still got that do, 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 do. That's right. So that characteristic kind of whip sound is what we're after. Um, the one on the bottom left is interesting. See the middle waveform on the downstroke. There's a little notch um, up the top, Martin, of the um, downstroke from the systolic. So sometimes you will get a little shoulder on that downstroke and that can actually indicate that there's a proximal stenosis. Um, so it still might be a biphasic waveform, but you'll get that characteristic shoulder on the downstroke, which can mean um, there's pathology further up. I'll just try and play that. Yeah. Oh, it's uh... not cooperating. There we go. Now, for me, it's very hard to hear that second mm -hmm. uh, sound. But we can see oh, yeah. it. But it's, yeah. not an, it's not a healthy biphasic, that is it, at all. And then this one here, interestingly, you look at that and think, beautiful, triphasic signal. We've got the upstroke, the downstroke, and the and the and the third one there. But if we listen to it, just have a listen to this one. Now it's actually not yeah. that easy to hear, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you could call that monophasic if you were listening in and you weren't quite sure, but it's not really easy. Although we see it very clearly, I, I think I purposely on that one had the Doppler at the wrong angle, um, but we could see it and we we struggled to hear. Mm. So it's just interesting that we you know, th this is the game we have to play with with Doppler signals it's a beautiful tool and we can get a lot of information but we need to put it in context and we really need to have other information around that signal to help build the picture safely yeah and at the we end of the day the that's right at the end of the day it's it's qualitative and that's it's one of its pitfalls is it depends on the operator so it depends on technique but also that interpretation and we don't we don't get a number from it, um, just a category. And that can be more difficult when you're uh, maintaining people over a period of time to compare where they are. I think for me, Peter, one last point on this, that if you combine pressure with uh, waveform, it gives you really useful information in the high-risk diabetes patients. So if you've got a calcified um, artery and we can't compress it, so we get an ABI of 1.5 or greater, but we've got a bi lovely biphasic signal, 
I have many gentlemen in Manchester who smoke 20 a day and they're 85 years old and they've got biphasic calcified arteries. I'm not too worried about their foot risk, maybe their yeah. cardiovascular risk, but not their foot risk. But then I've got people with um, uh, non-compressible arteries and monophasic signals and I'm worried about these people. So when you get the uh, non-compressible plus monophasic, they're the ones that I want to, if, particularly if they've got a key symptom or a non-healing wound, they need to go and see the vascular team. But the biphasic calcifieds, where there are no significant pains and no wounds, I'm quite happy that we manage those in a cardiovascular paradigm most mm -hmm. of the time, but keep an eye on them. And I think Martin. one of the common things, sorry, is that no, no, Peter. people on, please. will, um, people will go, oh, well, they've got one biphasic pulse. So they're okay. So we'll find a, a monophasic DP pulse, for example, but the, um, the, the PT pulse might be biphasic. So they'll be like, oh, they've got one good one. And in terms of limb salvage, yeah, sure, that kind of makes sense. But, um, you know, we've got a, a positive test for PAD. So it's important to remember, even if there's just one yep. monophasic pulse, that that's indicative of um, PAD. The, the, the limb isn't a risk, but the life is. That's right, yeah. Uh, Martin, I just had a question come in from a, from a good friend of mine who wants to re remain anonymous because they're <laughs> embarrassed that the question's too okay. basic and simple. But it, but it, it ties in nicely with, with two things. Firstly, Peter's saying how we need, we need to probably uh, prioritise getting better at Doppler. And also a comment you just made about intentionally changing the angle of the Doppler to make a, a triphasic sound monophasic. And I, the question is, you know, are there any tips for, for Doppler use? I know you've got a Doppler on your desk there. Do you mind giving us a quick demo? <laughs> That's okay. He just um, carries them around in his pocket. They're just hanging around on my body 24-7, yeah. I have to say. I, I, I swallowed one into the Houses of Parliament in December. We gave a talk in the Houses of Parliament on podiatry and vascular disease and the way the prof profession is moving on. I managed to get one through the security into there. but didn't get a chance to use it on, a, on an MP, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, s simple things like if I just turn this on. Hang on. Um, the, the main thing is if we're using the wrist there instead of the leg as an example, um, I think it's the angle. So obviously I'm pointing the wrong way here, but I, I point towards the heart. And I think that idea of being at about 45 degrees is really important. Not pressing too hard. I think a lot of podiatrists, particularly if the pulse is quiet, if you can just hear it, you might press harder and then lose it. Okay, so just sliding around in the gel, 45 degrees, till you get a signal. If you move more vertical, a lot of podiatrists start vertical and press too hard, it goes. So release the pressure off and move back to 45 degrees. I think the 45 degrees and light pressure and lots of gel is the simplest way to advise most podiatrists on how to improve technique. You know, it's... It's a beautiful tool, but you, you can listen to pulses virtually everywhere. So even in your finger, but in a small artery, that will sound maybe mon monophasic. It's not, but it's a small artery. So we need to not worry too much, but you know, you can go all over the place with these and listen. And in the brachial, for example, if you are listening to brachial, I think it's a case of knowing to start mid elbow again. I can't really show you on the screen though, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> sorry. Let's slide towards the body. Again, it's light pressure, 45 degrees. And one key principle we teach our podiatrists is anchor your hand first on the foot. Because a lot of them start like this, and then they're wobbling around, and then they try and get a sphig cuff going, and they're off the pulse straight away. <laughs> but always, always anchor your hand. Use it like a marker pen, like you're going to be writing something quite um, important uh, on a blackboard or something like that, and you just rest it gently, but always anchor. So if the, if the foot's moving around, the patient's coughing and jumping, you move with them. And you stay on your pulse. So anchor the hand firmly on the patient's foot. I think other than that, it's just about practice and practicing in your easy patients before you get the hard one. So mm -hmm. listen to everybody just for a few seconds. Um, the main pulses, the, the foot pulses and the popliteal pulse behind the knee. 
an absolutely simple pulse to listen to and a great bit of information to add to the foot pulse picture, particularly if you've got edema around the ankle and you're struggling a bit there to, to hear the phases, have a listen behind the knee and just stick your Doppler probe in there, 45 degrees, lateral side of the knee usually, um, knee nice and relaxed and bent a little bit, and you'll usually pick up a signal and decide again there whether it's biophasic, monophasic or not. Sure. So I think we, we do lots of Doppler basic workshops, and we've got some stuff, Perfect. some very amateur videos on YouTube that people can have a look at wow. to have a look at technique. That, so. that, thanks. that actually answers the next question. Graham Franklin's just posted a question about, is there a good resource to learn about the sounds and the waveforms? So maybe again, we'll, we'll link to your YouTube stuff once we, we've yeah. wound up and there are a few other questions coming in, which I think we'll have to hold till hopefully okay. one of you two can answer them later. But you got any more pressing questions? I am looking at the time. We're sort of, as always, we, we, we're up to 50 I minutes. So. Yeah. so you got anything? Craig, there, Craig's, a bit, uh, Craig's a bit militant with this. I, we've got a few, but you're a bit militant with the time. There's nothing thing here probably that we can't um there's one just one from angie that i'd probably like to uh, ask to uh, to peter which is would you advocate a printout together with the doppler sounds uh, so you've got sort of uh, that, that that next level of information uh, in clinic yeah absolutely and there are software programs that will save your waveforms so you put in all your four waveforms um, you can also input your pressures and it gives you a picture of their vascular summary in a nice page which you can print out. Um, also important in an Australian setting um, for DVA billing purposes you need to have a written record of your Doppler waveforms so um, that's an important one for Australian podiatrists if you're billing DVA for your Doppler um, you need to have that written or software record of your waveforms but certainly that's a way to um, compare from year to year or from assessment to assessment. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, I think we can probably uh, answer the rest sort of, um, or maybe Martin and Peter can, if they don't mind, ask them, answer the rest in text form once the, the video's on Facebook, Craig, so that we can not go over time too much. Um, along with um, any, uh, the sort of, for example, the, the paper, the Edinburgh paper that you referred to, and actually that, that software you just referred to, Peter, could we, could we link um, to those for everyone as well? Is that okay? Yep, not a problem. Perfect. Okay, over to you, Craig. You can wrap. You can wrap okay, up. Well, look, like, again, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us. It's, it's. We will get to all the questions. This video will be live or replay itself on f Facebook. It usually takes about fifteen to twenty minutes. It will be on uh, YouTube later today, Australian time. Um, please go to our website. Sign up for our email list we can notify you of this uh, like us on on youtube sorry subscribe on youtube so you get notified when they go there so thanks martin thanks peter it's actually it's actually been really good it, it's thanks guys i actually i actually did Amazing. learn something um it also refreshed my memory <laughs> of when i um i hate to think how many abi students used to get above one um so it, re it reminded me of that um <laughs> that was usually a matter of getting them to go back and do it again but um, <laughs> but no th thanks everyone thanks Pete. No. so there we go i've just i've stopped the live stream so we're not live now <laughs> okay thank okay, you no, that went really well yeah and there's there's thanks, guys. That was awesome. weren't as many comments as i thought there would be but they were a lot of people joining a lot of people watching oh, and there's a couple Loads of questions of coming watching. in now so yeah Oh, good. Um, yeah, some really good stuff in there. Like, I didn't know that 50% of PAD was asymptomatic. So, I mean, I don't intend to see people over 50 because of my demographic <laughs> and my specialism, but but I still kind of, that's what I love about these things, particularly the episodes that are completely out of my comfort zone is I always leave a better person from them. So that's, that's <laughs> it's been self, completely selfish reasons for doing this kind of stuff, really. But no, that was awesome. And um, I guarantee there'll be loads more questions that, that, that come on, you know, as time, as time goes on. So if any really obvious ones come up, we might just ping them into the, you know, the little Facebook messenger group we have. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the questions that come okay. in and then we'll, we'll yeah. flag yeah. them. Through, yeah. you know, and only, you know, no rush, no urgency, but if you've got a spare couple of minutes over the next, you know, three, four days, just, just, um, just tinkle a little response to the, to them because we won't be yeah. able to answer them. So over yeah, to no, that, that's fine. Awesome. That was really, yeah, that was great. Did great. you get a feel for how many people came on? How many how many people did um, you get coming at, on? At one point there was sixty three people watching. Watching it live, uh, yeah. So Yeah, 
live. And that's big. That's big, actually, because we know that on average we get between 20 and 35 for most yeah. episodes live. Yeah. And then within, yeah. within three days, we tend to average around two and a half thousand views. Um, okay. depending on depending on the episode so um, 63 live is big um, how many let me the trouble is Facebook now yeah I've got while they're wait. buffering it and things. yeah they're, they're, they're surrendering the video so we've got to wait for the stats but yeah. and then of course it goes on YouTube as well so there'll be views in that there and so it's sort of um... okay oh here we go so I've got some early stats so far 578 views oh wow yeah no so it's yeah. amazing that's big. That's Good. Big. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to have to have to go because I've two minute, four minutes to eight. The girls leave for school in four minutes. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so anyway, thanks guys. I'll, thanks guys. I'll really, really well.